the idea is if you have a 2000 square foot home, three bedrooms, three bath selling for $800,000, will someone pay $900,000 for that same product when there's other available? Of course not. So it's law substitution. That's when we're using a sales comparison approach. Apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Welcome to the Selling Sandoval podcast, where we dive deep into the world of real estate in sunny California. I'm your host, Victoria Sandoval, and I'm thrilled to have you join me as I sit down with top-notch professionals, market analysts, and influential leaders who have mastered the art of closing deals. Together, we'll explore the ever-evolving market trends, debunk myths, and empower you with the tools to negotiate like a pro. So whether you're a buyer, seller, or agent seeking inspiration, this podcast is your key to unlocking real estate success in California. This is the Selling Sandoval podcast. I'm Victoria Sandoval, and I'm excited to embark on this journey with you. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Selling Sandoval. I'm here with Sydney. L- I want to say correctly. Yeah. Is that French? It is French. Oh, so fancy. <laughs> Thank you. He is today we're talking appraisals, right? So we're going to talk appraisals. Uh, this is going to be a two part series appraisals and ADUs. So the topic that everybody's so curious about. Thank you so much for being a guest. Thanks yeah. for having me. This is, first of all, your office is fantastic. If, if no one's ever been inside Victoria's office, it's, it's beautiful, it's sexy, it makes you want to just hang out. So yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Miami chic. It's like if Miami Ooh. and Beverly Hills had a baby. This is it. SVP would be born. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So tell us a little bit about, we're going to talk about appraisals first. Yeah. Uh, you've been an appraiser for how long? This is my 20th year. Yeah, so I, I've been in the good markets, the bad markets. I feel like I'm like legit now because I'm like here, you know. And how does one become an appraiser? I mean, did you, how did you fall into this this profession? Oh my god! Uh, okay. No, no, no! I wanted to be that sexy firefighter, you know, oh so I can make the firefighter calendar. Oh my god! And uh, well, yeah, exactly. So while I was waiting to like test, a buddy of mine at the time was doing loans in O2. He was like, "Hey, you should be an appraiser, and that'll happen." A buddy of mine just got into it. So I followed him for a day, like literally half the day. I go, this is what you do. So I went to school right away, got my education. And I started my appraisal career in uh, LA and Orange County. Oh, nice. And then when the market crashed, I found myself in San Diego. Nice. You're familiar yeah. with all markets in Southern California. All markets. Yeah. Wow. Matter of fact, our team covers from LA to San Diego and all the all five counties. So, so we, if, if I were to give you like a street name, you'd be like, oh, that's located here, here, or there, probably. We're that so, good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so explain for for those listeners who uh, who are like first time home buyers or just never purchased a home, yeah. and are familiar with the real estate industry. What is an appraisal? An appraisal is an opinion of value. Okay. All right, now it's based on both objective and subjective information. So objective meaning the home size, the location, lot size, condition, bedroom, bathroom. Those are the objective. Uh, uh, I guess things that we know about the property, mm-hmm. but then we as appraisers, we analyze data sets. So house is 1500 square feet. Another word is 1600 square feet, three, two, three, two. What's the, what's the implication of that hundred square feet difference in value? Mm-hmm. So we make a subjective um, opinion on that or adjustment factor. So okay. if you do get five appraisers out to a property, you may get five different appraisal values, but they should all be somewhat similar. Right. right. So Within a certain range. yeah. Uh, okay. So when it comes to appraisals, um, I've been told that usually when we're running comparables, mm-hmm. I've been told that you should stay within a one mile radius. Uh, you should go back three months, yeah. plus or minus <laughs> 150 square feet. Is that a good range when when running comparables for potential listings? It's a good range. And I, and I chuckle at that because there's two things. There's comparable sales and there's competitive sales, right? Ooh. So, yeah. So, so, so comparable is typically it's 20% plus or minus on the square footage. So if my house was 2000 square feet as an appraiser, we can look for cons between 1600 square feet and 2400 square feet. Now, if you have a house that's 2401 is just one square, one square foot off. I'm not saying that it's not a good comp. It just won't come up and populate within that 20% margin. So that's why you always meet the appraiser at the property. Right. And another thing, when it comes to how, how far back we can go, it's up to six months. Now, okay. I tell people stay within 60 days. And here's the reason why. Let's say, Victoria, you're going to go sign you know, a listing agreement today, and hopefully you are. Yes. And let's say you guys are looking at prices and you're saying, oh, look at this comp that sold four months ago. Mm-hmm. Then it takes you 30 days to get that property market ready. Right. right? Then you, it takes you another 30 days to get that property in contract. And once it's in contract, I come out, or one of my peers comes out within that 17-day contingency period. So that comp you're looking at four months ago is now seven months old. 
So I tell people to stay within 60 days because then by the time we come out, that comp is still relevant at right around three, four, four and a half months old. Yeah. When running comparables, should we always add a little bit of value if we assume it's going to sell maybe in a month or two or three uh, because of appreciation if we're in a, in a market where property prices are appreciating? That's a good, that's a very good question. And that's what we did. You are good. Why am I even here? <laughs> So, um, especially during COVID, what my team and I were doing, we're tracking the growth per month. So okay. yes, you have to anticipate that, right? And mm -hmm. if you're looking at your market, it's going at 3% a month, mm -hmm. then yes, it would be wise to get that price out there to saying by the time, but no one has a crystal ball, right. but you're hoping by the time that property gets in contract and the appraisal gets done, that it stays on par at 3%. But if it doesn't, then you probably have a problem. Right. The other thing I want to say is, I don't know if your listeners are nationwide or they're local to San Diego. Nationwide. nationwide awesome. So anywhere in the nation, let's say you're on either coast, Miami, since this is Miami chic, yeah. or you're in San Diego, if you're appraising, let's say on the boardwalk, right? Whether it's a condo or house, I can go 35, 50 miles away to find another home on the boardwalk if I didn't have enough data, recent data in my market. And then it may cross analysis adjustments based on percentages, market A, market B. And if this is really confusing to your listeners, you need to hire me, right? Yes, so, so. Information. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes we're running comparables uh, right on, you know, in, in Mission Bay, there isn't, there isn't anything around. Yeah. So I could just keep going up or down the coast. You, you can, right? But what I also would do to caveat that is find the last sale in Mission Bay right? And then the, the market that you're competing with that is 35 miles away, see how that did 18 months ago, because that was the last sale in my market. Mm -hmm. And then see if that's consistent, those markers are consistent, that I can make the methodology or those adjustment factors to today's market, if that makes sense. Wow. Yeah. It gets complex. Oh my God, I, think my <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, let's talk about okay, ADUs, right? We're going to have another segment about ADUs, but how much would you say if somebody wanted to build an ADU? Now, an ADU is an actual structure you're building on the lot not to be confused with the garage conversion how much value first of all yeah well i didn't want to get into cost we'll get into that later but how much value do you think that'll add to someone's you know it it really depends you know when they say location in real estate location 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 it also applies to all other products that are being done on that property such as an adu or something maybe a junior adu um it, it can add as little as let's say 75,000, it can add as much as 400,000 or even more, right? So it, it depends on the market. If you're coastal, if you are um, by a university, and now that we have like the MTR route or the midterm rentals, you know, and you have like the traveling nurses, if you're by hospitals, people are building ADUs and they're putting traveling nurses in there. And in some markets where there's restrictions to vacation rentals, those are perfect because you're renting for three, six, nine months out of the year where you can still have utility, use it for family that's coming in for the summer, but you're able to really maximize the dollar amount on your investment when you're renting to nurses who are professionals or maybe corporate, you know, um, people that are coming in for a short amount of time. So I think that's the real ticket is getting together with like a, a real estate professional that knows the market, has studied that market and really knows how to assist or advise you on, hey, if you're going to build an ADU, here's the size you want to do in this market. Here's the location. Here's kind of like, like the... Um, I don't know, like the, the style of design, should it match the house? Should it be some other, you know, contemporary thing that doesn't match the neighborhood? So the, all those things are really important when it comes to accessory building units. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Love that. Good stuff. Oh, now, market data approach, income approach, comparison approach. My brain's going to explode. You are talking my language right now. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck does all that mean? Okay. So again, um, I mean, if you have your real estate lessons, you should know. This is true. <laughs> We're pretending, guys. This is all for show. This is a backdrop. We're actually in Miami right now. Yeah. You know? Um, so market data approach, sales comparison approach is the law of substitution. That's typically done when you're dealing with single family to single family, right? Right. Um, the, the idea is if you have a 2,000 square foot home, three bedrooms, three bath, selling for $800,000, will someone pay $900,000 for that same product when there's other available? Of course not. So it's law substitution. That's when we're using the sales comparison approach. Apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're dealing with the income approach, typically that's done with two to four units. Okay. So when, when someone is investing in a duplex, triplex, quadruplex, the intent 
typically is for investment purposes. So then the value is more weighted on income, not necessarily comparison on sales, right? So, you know, we, then we're using like things like GRMs, which is a gross rent multiplier, right. which essentially means we're taking the average monthly rent, dividing that by the sales price gives you a GRM. So it actually structures, you know, how much this property is worth. And because now in San Diego, or I would say many in every market, rents are through the roof then it's like the valuation on the, on the income side is always going to be lopsided. It's going to be, it's going to show a higher value in income than it does even on the sales. Mm -hmm. But then that's as you as a professional, how you incentivize someone to buy this product saying, Hey, we'll discount it a little bit here because we know the income that you can produce on this, uh, on this backside. So but situations where somebody has a single family dwelling okay. and they have an unpermitted garage conversion and an oh. unpermitted ADU. How do we, what do we do as, as agents? How do we determine the value when trying to list a property like that? Help us. You set your hair on fire and run for the hills. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this is tough, right? And, he, and here's why. There's a few things that need to happen in any appraisal scenario. There, there's uh, marketability, there's acceptability and conformity. Marketability simply is, was it marketed out to the general public on the MLS? Okay, yes, it was, fine. Did that property end up selling? Yes, so that's that's showing market acceptance. And there's conformity. Conformity is there other examples or comps that represent that product, right? You have a single family with non-permitted spaces. Um, what in a nutshell, I'm gonna really kind of dumb this down um, so people can actually understand this. And, and essentially, what we're doing is let's say we have a 1,500 square foot home with a two car garage, and we establish at the market the two car garage is worth 25 grand. Okay, done. And then we have these other examples of non-permitted or garage conversions. But then, you know, it's sold for 60,000 more than the single family with a the garage. Then we're saying, okay, well, the contributory value of that garage is not 60,000. It's 60,000 minus the, the, uh, the adjustment factor for the garage, which is 25. So we're giving $35,000 additional value towards the, the illegal garage conversion or the illegal ADU. So I think it's, we really have to manage our clients' expectations. We have, I have to sit there and actually explain this to them right. saying, yeah, it's non-permitted. Yes, you can get max rent for it, mm -hmm. right? There is a risk factor for the buyer because the city can come in at any time and go, oh, you can't do this. They can red flag it, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for, we're, we're, ex we're really just pulling out the value from what the comps tell us. As appraisers, I think the biggest misconception from an appraisal standpoint is that we go out to debunk value. It really isn't. We, we, we come across non-permitted spaces all the time. It's what is the market going to pay in market meaning buyers? What are they willing to pay for a non-permitted space versus a garage? Now, if someone has their toys and they have their cars, they want to park their cars in their garage, that illegal conversion is worth nothing to them. So then we apply what we call a cost to cure, meaning how much will it cost to make that illegal unit garage conversion back into a standard garage? And then, you know, then it could be five grand to kind of remove walls, things like that. So it, it really is in the eye of the beholder when it comes to residential real estate, which is far different from like commercial real estate, you know, so. Right. So a couple of questions. What about what's what's it cost nowadays to get permits? Is it really difficult to get you know, every city is different. Typically, I think they base it on the estimated amount of construction cost, right? So I just applied for a permit in the city of Lemon Grove um, where I am adding 1,175 square feet and my permit cost is right around 1,100 bucks. So to me, it's like 1% of, you know, the construction cost. It used to be very large, like 30 grand because th they, they were saying it was like the impact fees. Impact fees are you're putting a new construction, you have to bring in utilities, all those kind of things. So in most cities, I would think it's under seven grand, you know, between maybe three to five thousand dollars in the city of San Diego or Chula Vista, things like that. So um, it's unknown. I, I believe it's based on construction dollars, but, you know. And if somebody wanted to build an ADU and or property and possibly build an ADU, are you open to going out to assess what the future value could be if they did do that? I think it's very smart. Before you invest your dollars, you should know what your return is, right? So, and and look, I'm not here to gas anyone up. I'm not here to make you feel good. And I tell mm -hmm. this, I tell this to my investor clients all the time. I'm here to show you data and prove the model, saying, hey, this is the this is the value add if you do this. Now, you know, people, it's called present day value for future use. So people, especially investors, will go, okay, Sydney, I'm buying this dump. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to do X, Y, Z to it. You know, here's my scope of work. Right. So I go, okay, based on your scope of work, if you do this, here's the, the value add that you're going to get at the end of the day, or they, they call that the ARV, the after repair value. 
Um, and so lenders want that too, when they're doing maybe like an FHA two or three K loan. So they're buying a property that needs a lot of work, but they're expected to, you know, add construction square footage, whatever, 80, whatever that is. And then a lot of what we do is projection. So we're giving you some, exactly something that's proposed. It's not yet there. Okay. Yeah. yeah that must be difficult, especially when it takes six months to build or even up to a year to build. Yeah. How do you know? It's tough, right? I mean, like again, it's present day value for future use. So we're letting you know what it is, what's it worth today. Now, it's not going to vary. If I say the eighty is worth two hundred grand, it's not going to go down to one twenty five like all of a sudden in six months, because the market is showing acceptance. It's showing like, hey, this is the new trend, and this is where people are going. It's the only way for a single family resident property to now become an investor. And you work with lenders and attorneys and yeah, all uh, of it. So if anybody was interested in getting a hold of you, yeah. Uh, how do they get a hold of you? You know what? I say go to IG. You can drop me a DM, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so but cool. I, well, IG, yeah. you know, it's that it's that new thing. I'm just trying to keep up. <laughs> but but it, I, I'm, I do a lot of videos on IG because I feel like um, your, your IG's great. Thank you. Yours is too as well. Yeah. So it depends if I'm advertising to attorneys. I put it more on LinkedIn. Realtors IG because yourself. You know, you guys are on IG. Yeah. Um, you can also get a hold of me if you want to. You know, find me on email. But my my IG is South Shore underscore appraisals um phone number 619-453-2799 don't call me after 10 but uh, <laughs> shoot me a text but uh it's just one of those weird things you know back in the day it was like you never call someone past eight like right. now i'll like send a, a realtor a text like oh. hey can we schedule this appraisal like and it's like 10 o'clock i'm like if you answer that means you're up right right, but, right. Yeah. yeah exactly i mean we work in the summer we're entrepreneurs i'm yeah. gonna my clients we're texting Midnight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Six a.m. Look so at you. They're willing to talk. Hard yeah. worker, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. Okay. A couple things that are mind boggling, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So, refinances. If somebody was refinancing, it, I, I, I've heard. I don't know if this is a myth, but I've heard that appraisers are a little bit more conservative when it comes to a cash out refi versus a purchase. I, I don't know if it's a myth, but I know that it happens and, and it shouldn't because you have to understand market value is market value always. The difference is on a purchase, let's say we have a purchase of $1.2 million, right? Now, as an appraiser, what I'm thinking is, is there enough market data to support $1.2 million? Which makes it easier because he has a number there. Now, in a refinance, there is no $1.2 million like that's shown to you. But if you're looking at the most recent sales that is most similar to the subject property and those have sold for 1.2, guess what? I'm refining my refi appraisal is going to be at 1.2. I'm not going to just automatically appraise for a million fifty just because there's no number now that I have to hit. I think a lot of appraisers try to hit a number instead of always appraising the market value. Okay. Now, now what about when somebody, uh, Somebody purchases a property and the appraisal comes back at like eight seventy six three three three. See, where, where did that come from? The three three three. How do you get calculated? No one is that good. That is a total bullshit right there. Okay. So I think from that, that's that's a pure example of an appraiser hitting a number. Like, how good are you to get it down to the dollar? I know. Right. I mean, so I would be weary of that. Um, and here's why. I think the importance of not hitting a number is because I don't know what the buyers are gonna do if they have equity. You know, a lot of people are trying to, I do a lot of appraisals for homeowners for PMI removal. You know, once you get to that 80, 20 threshold. So I don't hit a number. Sometimes I go, Oh my gosh, that realtor left money on the table. Mm -hmm. Meaning I appraise over the contract price because I'm the contract price is there. I want to make sure that there's enough data to support that. But then once I figure and I'm doing my adjustments, I'm like, Hey, it's coming up way above it. That's my number. You know, I won't change that. So um, and maybe it could be negotiations that the buyer may use as well. If they know like, okay, well, we're coming in with equity. Maybe we will take care of a portion of closing costs because we know there's enough value gap in there. So um, I think it's important for everyone to do their job always and, and, and don't like half ass it, you know? And I think a lot of the times it, this myth comes from refi purchase because appraisers are maybe a little bit too conservative and not really confident in their valuation. So they just want to be somewhere in the middle somewhere. Give them too much value, they might take. Yeah, and I, can it backfire on you as an appraiser? How so? If you give too much value, I, I don't give too much value. I give value based right. on the market. Right, but other appraisers, <laughs> not you, but the other appraisers. It could, I guess you know, like I'll, I'll be honest, like I've appraised in Encinitas, mm -hmm. and I've done a million dollar adjustments for a home on the bluff versus versus sand frontage. Sand frontage, you get more value. 
you know, and the first time I did it, I go, well, this all makes sense. You know, I think it was for like Chase Bank or something. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Chase Bank. <laughs> um, sponsor me now. But um, yeah, and I was just like, you know what? But it made sense. I go, it's a million dollar difference between this house and this house. They're all the same. They're all oceanfront. But this one's on a bluff and this one's on San Frontage. When you start looking at your job as far as like paired sales analysis and you really start to break it down, the, the numbers appear to you. <laughs> it sounds mystical, but they do. They'll come at you. It's really simple. So oh, you're doing your job. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Stay tuned for episode number two. Save it number two. We're going to go over 80 views. Until next time, bye. Ciao. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Selling Sandoval podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned for more valuable insights and practical tips. Remember, whether you're a buyer, seller, or an aspiring real estate agent, the Selling Sandoval podcast is your trusted companion in navigating the dynamic California real estate landscape. Until next time, keep dreaming big and making those real estate dreams a reality. This is Victoria Sandoval signing off from the Selling Sandoval podcast, wishing you success and happiness in all of your real estate endeavors.